Ah, good afternoon. My name is Rick. Oh, clicker. I need my technology. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Let's see if this thing works. Yay. So, welcome to the revolution. I'm going to try and cram about three hours worth of uh, conversation into 20 minutes, or the stage manager kills me. So we're going to go very fast, prepare for a ride. First of all, I'm representing my nonprofit, New Worlds Institute and the Earth Light Foundation. We have a conference in Texas you might recommend or might uh, recognize Etienne Schneider there in the middle from Luxembourg. We give it away a, uh, an award called the Space Cowboy Award. We gave one to this guy, the other bald guy. Has a little book company you may have heard of. Um, a few, uh, well, two years ago. And I have my company, Space Fund. We're a venture capital fund. We're working on funding frontier enabling technologies. The concepts that we have are very simple. Open the frontier, let people participate, and those who participate share in the profits of what happens. We're very happy right now because one of our companies we invested in just three weeks ago was given a $400 million contract by NASA to put a hotel room on the space station. It's a very interesting model. We have a team that helps start what they call new space. We have uh, inside access. I hate to use the word inside. It's a bad word in, in uh, venture capital. But uh, we have a traditional structure. It's old school. You can come in. Or if not, you can buy security tokens and become a part of our investment team. If you're interested, talk to me later. But let's do the show. Let's talk about why I'm here. As you've seen, cars in space, this kind of stuff, pretty cool. The things that Elon is doing, very, very cool. But really, it's not about these guys. It's not about Jeff. It's not about Elon. It's not about Richard. It's not about them. It's about her. It's about the Earth. I love this planet. It's an amazing, beautiful place with amazing life, all kinds of incredible incredible organisms, ecosystems, amazing things. I love it. I also like humanity for all of our flaws. Even though we're apes with technology, we try to do the right thing. I travel the world, and outside of the politicians and the newscasters, most people are really good, and I like them. I believe, personally, that this is the most important 100 years in the history of humanity, not just humanity, but life on Earth. In fact, not just life on Earth, but if we're it, life in the universe. The 100 years starting around 1940 to 2040, when we developed the ability to kill ourselves with our technology, and at the same time using almost the same technology, almost the same technologists, almost the same people in the same culture that had decided to kill itself potentially, we have learned to be able to reach for the stars. Where we're trapped in this cage, we went to the moon 50 years ago, and we're still stuck in this cage. It's because we, our psychology, we look at the small things. We don't think big. You know, the future, they're not going to remember this stuff, this guy. They're going to remember this, how well we carried humanity and life across the bridge into the future and out into the universe. We started, like I said, 50, 60 years ago, with a little spacecraft called Sputnik. We went to the moon, and on the way to the moon, we looked back at the Earth, and we realized how fragile we were. But we did go to the moon, and we pulled it off. And we could do anything. They still call that kind of success a moonshot, because it showed that you can start with almost nothing and reach the moon. But at the end of that, all we had was flags and footprints. Well, physically, that's all we had. But there was one major spinoff that occurred on the way to the moon. And that was because there were a bunch of little kids watching. Watching and seeing it all happen on TV in front of them. And they would change the channels, and there were terrible things like Vietnam, terrible wars going on. You might start to recognize some things that you see today. But then you flip the channel, and my gosh, they're driving cars on the moon. And you flip the channel, and there are nuclear weapons that can kill us all. And you flip the channel, and oh my god, there's Captain Kirk in Star Trek. And you flip the channel, and there were riots like this in South Africa at the time. And you flip the channel, and there's Voyager, and we're reaching out into the solar system and beyond. 
And you flip the channel and there's hatred and people screaming and yelling at each other and incredibly bad role models. And you flip the channel and they're good role models. And then you go to the theater and you'd see stuff like this. Han Solo, Leia. And off we would go into, the, into space. And yet, looming over it all, was a chance that we might die. In fact, the Union of Concerned Scientists built a clock. And they put us at one minute to midnight. So when I was growing up, while we would dive under desks, in my country, people dive under desks. Now kids are trained to dive under desks because somebody might roll in with an automatic weapon. When I was growing up, we would dive under desks because we thought we might get nuked. It's very similar times. At the same time, we were promised this great thing called the space shuttle. It was going to fly us into space and be completely reusable. It was going to cost $100, $200 a kilo to go into space. Anything was possible. Unfortunately, it turned into this sort of circular, as a friend of mine calls, self-licking ice cream cone, where large companies just started making tons of money. But in the middle of that, a guy named Jerry O'Neill wrote a book called The High Frontier. And by the way, this, this young kid who later on had a book company, he sold this as one of his first books. In fact, when he graduated high school, he gave the valedictorian speech, and he said, you know what? I'm going to make money, and then I'm going to go build colonies in space. So what you're seeing today isn't rich boys and their toys. There's a much bigger, more important story here. Some of us got into the revolution. I decided to go fight the fight. And we took on the establishment, the aerospace industrial establishment, at the, as they called it at the time. We took it on. We fought. We tried to change the laws. Some of us tried to build and fly rockets. This was the Conestoga, the first commercial rocket ever flown. It didn't work, but they tried. And there's a whole series of crashes, and you guys are entrepreneurs, you know what that's like. But then we kept going, we kept going with our element of vision and stupidity mixed together that says, I'm going to keep going, I don't care what happens. It's an entrepreneurial spirit. Eventually, we kind of won. This magazine said we won, but we really haven't won. There are still battles to fight. We did get rid of this. I remember putting out a press release that said, scuttle the shuttle. We had to get it out of the way so that we clear the opening. And we changed the laws that allowed commercial spacecraft to go to and from the space station. And this year, you're going to see the first commercial spacecraft carry private citizens to and from the station. But we're still in the cage because we have more work to do. And that work involves three things that I call the keys to the frontier. First, you have to be able to get there back and forth cheaply, easily, and reliable, like an airline, like an airplane, like a ship. You can't throw pieces of it away every time. Second, you have to have the use of space resources. Anywhere, anytime, by anybody. And third, you need government support of an open frontier. You don't need them blocking you. You need their help. And it's not about anarchy. We can all work together. So first, the government support. A few years ago, I held an event in Washington called the Space Pioneering Summit. We got 100 people together, left and right, Scott Pace, who runs the President's Space Council, Maury Garver, who would have been Hillary Clinton's NASA leader. We got them all in one room, and they agreed on a statement that said human settlement should be the foundation of the U.S. space program. What was interesting, though, was other countries moved faster to actually make the laws happen. So we had Luxembourg, visionary Luxembourg, jumped in the front and started passing laws and creating funds. UAE. While the U.S. was still debating the idea of whether we should settle space, UAE will now go down in history as the first country on Earth to declare and fund the idea that they are going to settle space. UAE. They're going to put a city on Mars in 100 years. They were, they're building a $140 million facility to inspire their youth and to begin looking at these things. Because if we can get water out of the sands of Mars, why can't we do it in the Sahara? So we're starting to see these laws come into place. We're seeing these policies come into place. And it's not about the big countries and the little countries. Anybody can get involved. So who's next? Who's going to sign up next? Call your representatives. Why not? Oh, and then there's these guys. They're going. They're going big time. Why? Because they've been reading our books. They've been coming to our conferences. And they're going for it. And it's great because we need everybody out there. Because at the end of the day, 100 years in, 
no matter who you came from, what country put you there, eventually you're going to go, screw you, you don't understand us, we're declaring independence. That goes all the way back to the Greek colonies in the Mediterranean, not just where I come from. It happens every time. New cultures are born. So I call this the Alpha Town process. A country will put an outpost in the frontier, and forgive my lack of political correctness, I have to use the history of my country. But as you'll see in a minute, it's going to be very different as we move into the future. But countries would put an outpost on the frontier, and then around that outpost, trading starts to spring up. And then using the line that goes back to the country, trade starts to go back and forth. And at the end of the day, you end up with a thriving city. And in the middle of it's a little museum where the original forts or outposts used to be. This is Toronto. So this is the current government outpost. And here's the challenge we have. So this thing I have in my pocket here, you've probably got one. Used to be a telephone, by the way. Now it's part of your connection to the global brain. It's an application development platform. It allows you access to the universe of human communications and ideas. And as people have accessed it, you, the people, a lot of the business plans you've been hearing access it. They create new ideas, new processes, new products, new services. And amazing things happen, including, yes, your grandmother can send you pictures of cute cat tricks. But it's amazing what's going on right now, because we, the people, have access to this platform. Here's our platform that has access to the entire physical universe. It is usually populated between three and six people at a time right now. And according to one of my friends who used to run the NASA human space flight, between one quarter and three and a quarter of those people, their time was available to dream, to think up new ideas, to do commercial experiments, to do great things. The rest of the time, basically it takes about three people, 2.75 people, just to keep the station running, just to keep the lights on. So we have to build off of this platform. We have to enable other people to get involved. We have to open it up, and that is what is happening. So this is the Bigelow module that was attached for storage. He's going to spring off of it, bud off of it, grow out of it eventually, and build a private space facility. This is the other company, which was just awarded the large contract, the one we invested in, called Axiom. They're building basically a hotel room on the station. A hotel room. And then things start to happen, and people start to build towns. They start building cities and towns down the orbital street. And, uh, and then, okay, whatever. Things start to happen. It's amazing. So then you have to be able to use resources. So imagine coming to my quote-unquote new world where I grew up. If they had had to carry everything they ever needed to do all of the exploration with them, and they threw parts of it away on the way over. Instead, what they did was they lived off the land. So this is a spacecraft of its time in the U.S. And in front are the engines. And the propellant is on the ground around them. They're living off the land. In fact, the spacecraft itself is made out of native material. We can learn to do the same thing in space. The resources of the asteroids, the ice at the poles of the moon. If we can allow free enterprise to work, we can begin to share this wealth around the world. I, I love the phone, the mobile phone, as an example. Created basically out of technologies that were developed for government use, much of them from the space program, that was given to the people and the internet itself. And look what's happened. It's everywhere everywhere, because we let people go. The other way to engage people is as Virgin Galactic just did, they opened up their shares, so you can actually invest in Virgin Galactic now in the stock exchange. But we're still locked in. We have to get out there and back. This is the key, the big one. Those kids, those kids we're watching though, they're working on it. E Elon Musk is building spacecraft. Jeff Bezos, a billion dollars a year out of his money is going into building space systems. Because he said that back in the day, the internet was already created, FedEx was already created, the post office was already created, so two kids in a dorm room could come out of a company, or could create a company, 
and leverage off of that infrastructure and create a major, major company. He wants to do the same thing in space. And you've got this guy. He likes publicity, but what the heck? Everybody's going for their own reasons. He also shares the dream, though. I know that for a fact. And, of course, Elon. The starship. It's coming, folks. It is quite possible that in the next five years, we could see the cost of going to and from space drop down to that cost that was initial, initially projected. 100, 150 euros a kilo to go to space. Think about that. This is what's going to make it happen. I call this space porn, by the way. It's like, oh, oh, let's do it again. It's so, it's amazing. That was a turning point in history. The beginning to reuse technologies over and over and over again. It's coming, and it's going to break us out of the cage. And the revolution begins. The Israelis flew a spacecraft that almost made it to the moon. It's coming. CubeSat technology, standardization that lets kids in school in the semester build spacecraft in one unit of school that can actually fly in space. And yet, nowadays, we still have those issues we faced before, except they're in different form. So now they're swiping instead of changing channels. And they swipe, and they see greed, and they see hatred. It's mine, it's not yours, you can't come here. We have terrible role models. And we're looking at that clock coming up again. One more minute to midnight. Except now it's a different manifestation of our technology that can kill us all. So let's do space. Let's open the frontier. As you go into the frontier, all of the ideas, all of the concepts, all of the virtues that can make us great come together. All of them. And what will happen when we give these children, by the way, these are kids from my conference in, in Austin, if we give these children a chance to go out there and do what they want to do. You see, it's very different this time. This time we get to go together. This time we don't take it from anybody. We go as one family. We give it to everybody. Everybody can be involved. And we can do amazing projects out there. There's a lot of talk I hear sometimes about, oh, you're going to go out there and you're going to leave us behind. And once in a while, I, I, I have to send a message through friends to my buddies like Elon, and they're not buddies, but they're fellow travelers with me. And I, like, please, dude, don't copy the president's Twitter habits. Just stop. Just shut up. Just focus on getting us out there. You know, don't keep talking about, well, we're going to go to Mars and we're going to leave the planet or something. No, we can do great things in space. And there are three projects that I'm, I'm very fond of. One is Earth Shield. We can protect ourselves from asteroids, things that could kill us. I call this one Earth Shine, and uh, we can capture the light of the sun and create energy. And then this one's perhaps the most controversial, but I think may end up being the big one. It's called Earth Shade. What if global warming tips over into what we call runaway greenhouse and starts to get ahead of us? And because many countries, like mine, are not paying attention fast enough and doing the changes fast enough, it starts to get ahead of us, and we need to stop it to take a time to get our act together. We can fly some objects between the Earth and the sun, small. Now, people are against geoengineering, where we throw lots of powder into the atmosphere and things like that, because you can't control it. With this one, you can. You can move a little stuff in. If it's too much, we move it back out a little bit, things like that. These are the kinds of things we can do in space. I haven't even touched on what's possible because I don't know, because I don't live there. But once we have people living out there, they can look at it and come up with amazing things to do. What about Estonia? You know, there is a tendency for small countries to be relegated to what I call the ghetto of space. Okay, you can do some small satellites, and you can observe your crops from, the, uh, from space, and 
people that you kind of hook on as a little tiny partner on the side of what the big guys are doing. Think about it. We have individual people in the United States who have their own little space programs. Why can't countries like Estonia have their own? Why not? What are you going to give these kids right here? What are you going to give them? I have a suggestion. Why not give them one of these? Why not? Why not have the Estonian starship? Why not? You could do it. The government might not, but you might have enough wealthy people or individuals who form together into a corporation in Estonia and make this your goal, to build settlements or colonies on other worlds. Why not? And if you want to give them something to do, why not this? Why not? Really. Remember that cage? It's not gravity that keeps us on the earth. It is not vacuum that kills us out there. It is not radiation that we fear. It is our own imagination. It is our own lack of imagination that locks us to this planet. It is not those other things. Why not? It's time for this to have a new conversation. It's time for us to talk about something different. It's time to get out of this fear and start talking about creating something new, something amazing. You know what we do is we have a tendency to look at what we are trying to propose in terms of the right brain. You know, it's got to be on a spreadsheet. The business plan has to close. Yes, later it will. But there are real reasons we're going. We can preserve our culture to advance human society, to protect and expand life. And I do believe that we are the mechanism by which the universe is aware of itself. And the universe isn't all here on this planet. It is time for us to go out there and see, touch, taste, and feel what is possible. Let's go back to the moon. I love this, by the way. This is the European Space Agency concept of the moon village. Not a base, not an outpost, a village. What a beautiful term. We can plant trees on the moon. We can do anything we want. We can settle space. We can go to Mars. We can build colonies in space itself. On and on and on. The future is ours. I have one request for you. When you leave here today, to go out into a field when the sky is clear. Go out into a field and look up at the stars. And let yourself float up into that sky. Just let yourself open up. Let yourself feel right here what's possible. And dream. Dream big. Dream big. Let yourself go. Understand why we're here. Because as far as I'm concerned, we're here to go there. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We got one or two minutes. Thanks. Very inspiring. Very, uh, uh, absolutely, make a big lessons at the end. Now, well, I guess most of the days when we're thinking about space, we are thinking more about, if we're not thinking about the Space Force, which is coming for you, we're thinking about the entrepreneurs that you mentioned, because they're typical. We talked about Mr. Branson likes the publicity, but Mr. Musk also doesn't mind an article or two written about him. Sure. So that's, all, so that's maybe the perspective that a lot of people have, because that's all we're kind of hearing about with the current research. And it does seem like SpaceX, you said they, they landed the rocket, and that was an amazing thing for mankind. How is SpaceX doing it seemingly so well? Because even if Elon's a friggin' genius, he's still just one person. Mm -hmm. I mean, is he's, he's clearly a, a, an engineering genius, but is there something else in his secret source that's helping him do all of this? Yeah, I would say there are probably two things. One is, he's set a vision and a course, and he's brought and surrounded himself with brilliant people who share that vision. There's an old statement that says, you know, if you, want to, if you want to go across the oceans, don't hand your people hammers and pieces of wood. Inspire them to sail the ocean. That's one. Okay. Yeah. Number two, just to be frank about it, he's had a lot of help from the government. Right. There's yeah. been billions of dollars given to different projects that he's been engaged in to help him leverage, and mm. he's smartly leveraged from that. So those are really the two things. Okay. But he's driven by a dream. He really is. Number one, he's driven by a dream. 
I mean, and then, okay, then. And you, you did give us that inspiring speech about what can we do in Estonia, and we've got the S cube satellites, and we are doing that. But, like, Jeff Bezos has more money than the Republic of Estonia. Like, how can we even compete in mm -hmm. that? How does, beyond the hand-waving and the inspirational speeches, how do we <laughs> start to move in those areas? The hand-waving inspirational <laughs> speeches. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to diminish your talk there. <laughs> so, you just do it. I mean, look, you've just uh, had, what, a day and a half so far of people coaching entrepreneurs to start from nothing and create something, mm -hmm. all right? Now, there's some things people are talking about, sort of messaging networks and dating apps and this and that and the other. Those are all wonderful. But why not start something in space, find a niche, get engaged, and make it happen? It's the same process. Um, like Bezos that. didn't start with a ton of money. Elon mm -hmm. didn't really start with a ton of money. Right? That's where they are now. Right. You know, and I don't necessarily appreciate some of their business tactics. I, sure. I, totally, I totally get that. But, and, and also their egos. Absolutely. Right? You don't do this with small egos. <laughs> you actually have to have a sort of personal sense of invincibility to take on something this nuts. Mm. But you have to start. And you can often just start with something small. I don't, I'm the son of a sergeant. My dad had three jobs to pay my to keep us going in school and stuff. That's it, you know, I started with nothing. Mm. And I'm just lucky to be able to hang around. And what you do is business plan, you think, you study the topic, and you never, ever, ever give up. I like it very much. Please, one more round of applause for Rick. Thank you, sir.